Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Let's stand and sing.
Lord, as we gather here today, we definitely come with uh, a desire in our heart, at least many of us do. Uh, we don't come here with no expectation. We come here with the expectation of learning more about you, knowing you more. And Lord Jesus, we realize in Scripture you call us to be like you, and that's what we ask today that in all that we do here, as we sing about you, as we sing about your grace, as we think about your sacrifice in communion, as we uh, hear your word preached, Lord, we want to pray that you would change us and help us to become more like you, that we would be humble servants of one another, that we would look out for one another and help each other. Lord, we're so thankful for your grace in our lives that brings us into salvation and keeps us close to you. Even if we wander, Lord, you are there to forgive and, and to love us. So no matter where we've been, Lord, we want to gather here today and pray that you'd lead us into a closer walk with you and into greater Christ-likeness. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Probably a familiar hymn for us here to sing at this point. Uh, today is Communion Sunday. Keep that in mind. Uh, if you don't know this song, um, there's no excuse for you. Amazing Grace, the original. Again, welcome to you all, and uh, if you are new here to our church family, maybe you are a local here, a local resident, just checking things out, welcome. We're so glad you've decided to join us. In the pew rack in front of you, you'll find a visitor card. Please take a moment and fill that out and hand it in. That would be great. We could get to know you a little better. But uh, welcome to those of you who are also out here on vacation to enjoy the beautiful leaves. They are, for the most part, really falling. So you've made it just in time, tail end of all of this, but it's uh, good to have you join us as well. Thank you for being here. Wanted to point out some announcements. Uh, today, first of all, we need to know uh, men, high school on up, we have paintball. So um, I'm, there's always ladies events, but we actually have something for the men today. And so there's going to be lunch right after the service, and then off we go to Copper Mountain. Anything else to add to that, Nate? Anything else? Nope. All right. So guys, it's, uh, it's time. We need, we need you. Um, everything else is running as scheduled this week. 
Uh, we do have Awana and youth group yet this evening for, uh, for the youth. Take note of that. A couple of other things. We have our annual chili pie cook-off. It's going to be Thursday, October 21st. I told you to save the date last week, and it was a, a different date. So change it, resave it. We changed it last week. Thursday, October 21st, if you want to get your phone out and change it on your calendar, I won't accuse you of texting someone at this moment. Go ahead and do that. Sign up at the Welcome Center as far as what you're going to bring and all that good stuff. Calling all students. It's not too late to join in on the Christmas play, and uh, there's going to be a meeting at the church Wednesday, October 6th. That's this week at 530 uh, for more details on that. You can also contact Jen Lyons. I would normally point there, but she's at home. So I'll point there, Jen. You can go and talk to Jen. Her number is in the bulletin. Also, we have um, our Fall Ladies Bible Study, and it's already begun, but it's not too late for you ladies to join if you're interested. So uh, contact Jonelle Johnson or the office, and we will get you going on that. Uh, also, welcome back to all of you ladies who were gone on the women's retreat, the ladies retreat. It sounds like it was a great time, and uh, I'm thankful that you were able to go and get a little refreshment. I didn't hear of any emergencies there or at home with all of the dads and the kids. So I guess we, we made it. Yes, the Lord was very gracious. Uh, that's all of our announcements this morning. Let's turn our attention to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we, we're truly blessed by the reality of your grace that we were just singing about. Uh, we see it over and over again in Scripture, how you are gracious toward us. Lord, um, we understand that grace means that you have given us something good that we have done nothing to earn or deserve. We're undeserving of your goodness and your kindness. We're undeserving of forgiveness. We're undeserving of an inheritance in heaven, eternal life in heaven. But Lord, because you are gracious, you give it freely anyway. We're so thankful. Thank you for taking sinful people like us and saving us, bringing us into life, bringing us a spiritual birth that we can be born again into a living hope. Thank you so much, Lord, for your grace and for your mercy, the counteracting of that, where what we do deserve, judgment, you did not give that to us. Thank you so much. Lord, we look into this world around us. We see so much pain and suffering. The list is too long to even enumerate. God, there's just a lot of trouble out there and a lot of concern out there suffering and pain, a lot of lies, a lot of many things swirling around out there. And God, we are thankful that you are truth, that your word is truth, that we can come to a place like this, get a break from all that's going on out there, and we can focus in on something that's true, that we don't have to worry about its validity that we can just place our rest and trust in you and in what you're telling us in your word. I want to pray especially for those who are heavy burdened this morning with the trials of life. Uh, Lord, we know that there's so many challenges. I think of the business owners and managers that are having trouble with finding good help or any help for their businesses. Lord, we just want to pray that you would give them strength, help them to keep pressing on. We even find in a way in this uh, church as we search for your choice of, of a pa an associate pastor, we just com continue to commit that to you as we make that journey. But Lord, we pray for strength and endurance for us all as we try to keep walking by faith despite all these things around us that would shake us or attempt to shake us off the foundation. Help us to keep standing for the truth despite a world that is screaming against us and what we stand for. Help us to just keep pressing on, faithfully following you. And that as we do, that you would be bringing people across our paths that need to hear the gospel and that need to be saved and that they will see and hear the gospel from us, Lord, and that they would enter into that relationship with you. 
We want to thank you as well for the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus as we will be remembering that in a special way through communion in the minutes ahead. Lord, we want to thank you for that. All these things, Lord, we want to bring to you and, and we want to thank you as you continue to supply for this ministry day by day, month by month through those who have been sacrificially giving to uh, supply the needs of the ministry. Thank you, Lord. We ask for your blessing upon them. And Lord, for all of us as we continue to draw near to you, all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
sing this out together. thank you for that victory that was won when Jesus overcame the grave as he conquered death coming back to life Lord and we know as the as he is the firstborn of the dead into the glorified state Lord we know that we are yet to follow thank you so much for the truths that we learn about that in scripture uh, Lord we want to thank you again for the sacrifice that you have made for us as we now turn our attention to your word, Lord, work in us, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. As you're being seated, please uh, greet those who are... So no surprise to you, but we do have some handout notes available. Uh, if you haven't received a copy, raise your hand. Tim will be there to uh, get a copy for you. Again, welcome to all of you who are also joining us online. Good to have you with us today. One of these days, hopefully you'll be able to join us here in person if you're traveling through, if you live far away. but worst case scenario, which is also best case scenario, we'll be able to uh, fellowship in heaven. So that'll be a great thing. But I do see all of you checking in online. So very nice to have you all, all join us. And I don't want to overlook the obvious, that you all who are here today as well. We are also very thankful that you are here. Yes. First Thessalonians chapter 3. I know you are looking at the text today and you're saying, no, he's not covering 10 verses in one sermon. Well, this is going to be about a three-hour sermon, so we'll get them all done. Actually, no, we will get them all done, but uh, let's pray. Lord, we do want to ask you now to teach us. Um, just use your word in our lives, Lord. Help us to hear Paul's heart as he expresses these things, knowing that it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, what actually came out onto the paper that he was writing. And Lord, uh, encourage and challenge and instruct us in light of this. Uh, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. At one point in the previous church that I pastored, I had an office with a window that faced uh, our backyard, our church's yard, that then flowed into a pasture. It was a middle, in the middle of a growing city, but we really had a sweet plot of land that uh, had 
um, some pasture land with it for our building expansion and, uh, and then some pasture land even in the back. But I remember one day sitting at my desk, looking out the window, uh, thinking about my sermon outline and thinking through some of the concepts, and I noticed some movement that caught my eye, and it was a little kitten that was out there in the field and crossing into the, the lawn, the church lawn. And uh, so I was just following the little kitten with my eyes as it curiously made its way along. And then all of a sudden, wham! Get a little reverb in here from that. Wow. Uh, out of the sky came a hawk, slammed this kitten, talons locked in, and off the hawk flew with this little kitten. I thought to myself, I sat there a bit shocked, <laughs> I thought to myself, did I really just see that? Uh, personally, I like cats, don't hold that against me. For those of you who dislike cats, uh, some of you, you know, I, I thought, wow, uh, I was sad for a moment. Some of you, had you seen it, you would have thought it was the greatest thing ever. You would have been rejoicing. Uh, I did feel sad. Some of you would have been cheering. Uh, I probably had just a brief moment of silence in honor of the poor little kitten. But I thought to myself, man, come on, hawk, don't you have any respect? I mean, you're supposed to be taking out mice and rats and gophers. Kittens and little puppies shouldn't be on the menu. But let's be real, to a hungry hawk, there's no difference. I think he probably would have been disappointed for that little kitten was mostly fur, I think. Uh, he probably still was hungry after that. One of the other thoughts that I had amongst all these other strange ones I'm sharing with you, I was wondering, well, where was the mother cat? <laughs> Shouldn't she have been there to watch over and uh, protect her little kittens? Instead, she let it wander and stray out into a dangerous world, and it ended up costing the kitten its life. It ended up being a meal for a hawk. Oh, well, I'm sure the hawk was happy. And for me, you know, it was a unique thing. You don't see that every day. But on a more profound level, it did get me to thinking of how well it illustrates what can happen to new, vulnerable Christians in their faith. They might just be out there wandering around, minding their own business out there in life, and then all of a sudden, wham! A predator comes in and takes them out. Whether it be Satan swoops in and takes them out, whether it be the world that takes them out, maybe a false teacher, maybe a trial or temptation enters into their life and takes them out. Whatever the case is, it happens. It's a sad thing when a young Christian in the faith or any Christian gets taken out by a predator. One might wonder, well, what can be done to protect Christians from being attacked, from predators and dangers like that? Well, to some extent, um, in some cases, very little can be done because the individual Christian has made a point to deliberately walk around in dangerous places in life. They say, whether it's ignorantly or deliberate rebellion. They say, I would rather be walking around in dangerous, spiritually dangerous situations than trying to walk in holiness and safety. But God has, in fact, provided a way and supplied His people with a way to have some protection. God appoints and supplies pastors and spiritual leaders shepherds of people to watch over and to protect and to help. As we enter into chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians, we find Paul still pouring out his heart. He's been pouring out his heart since the very beginning of the letter. But he's writing, remember, to relatively young Christians. In chapter 1, he was talking about the many qualities and activities of this church that characterized this church that made him so thankful. He was pouring out his heart in that in thanksgiving. In chapter 2, he was talking about some of the qualities that made the ministry there so effective, even though it was for a relatively short time before Paul and his team were driven out of town, forced to leave. 
But now here in chapter 3, he uh, begins to move into a unique aspect of his heart that begins to show. His pastoral heart begins to really become evident. He's just written in his last statements of chapter 2, remember how he had been taken from them, taken away? And the term he actually used, uh, uh, aporfanizo, aporfanizo, I don't usually speak Greek, so I'm kind of a tongue-tied, but the uh, orphanos, the root word there, he was orphaned. He felt what it must feel like when a child's parents are taken away at death and they're left orphaned. He said, I felt like that when we were driven from you. He says, I long, I desire, I deeply desire to see you all again. He used the word that's most oftenly translated in Scripture as lust. He said, I deeply lust to see you all again. It wasn't a sinful thing. It just speaks of deep, strong desire. Paul was using these strong words to describe how he felt in being taken away from them and all that would all that would result, the ramifications potentially that would result from him being gone. He says, even in trying to come back to you guys on multiple occasions, he was being hindered by Satan himself. God was allowing Satan to hinder Paul from returning to them. That being said, he moves into chapter 3, and the very first word of the next statement is, therefore... In other words, in respect to all that he just said about him being taken from them and these guys being left alone, he says that he talks, goes on to talk about his deep concerns for their well-being. Verses 1 through 10, he's pouring out his heart. He reveals the actions that he took to make sure they were still okay because these people were facing some serious dangers to their faith not from a hawk swooping in, but illustratively speaking, there were many predators, many dangers that, were, that these people were facing, things that could have caused them to walk away from the faith. So Paul describes the actions that he took at great cost to himself to make sure they were doing okay, and then he concludes the chapter in prayer. We won't see his prayer in verses 11 through 13, but we are going to talk about his deep concerns and what he did to make sure that they were going to be okay. And so with this broad understanding of the text, now let's take a look at verses 1 through 10, what Paul actually wrote here, and let's see this pastoral heart as it is poured out on to the pages. He says, therefore, When we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know what we have been been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction And so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when we could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you, For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? As we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. Quite an emotional ride we see displayed here in Paul's writing. He's talking about this situation he's in where he can endure it no longer. The anxiety of not knowing what's going on over there. They're in danger. I hope everything's okay. 
to then this great relief where it's almost inexpressible the gratitude he wants to give to God on their account. But quite the pendulum swing in just these 10 verses, going from that anxiety and suspense to this almost indescribable relief and comfort, all seen as Paul's pastoral heart is being poured out. Now, practically speaking, I realize that not all of us in here are pastors. In fact, by title, there are very few here. However, the heart we see expressed by this pastor, Paul, it should be, at least in principle, the expression and desire of every Christian's heart as we care for our brothers and sisters in Christ around us. So these qualities that we see here, yes, they should describe every pastor, but they should also describe the shepherding care that we should be giving toward one another. So let's move through this text together and see some of these qualities and and principles that should really relate to us, but that are unfolded here in Paul. In verses 1 through 5, we see, first of all, Paul's concern. Paul's primary concern, as it should be for all pastors, is for the people's faith. You might say a doctor's primary concern might be for a person's health. Uh, A coach's primary concern might be for an athlete's performance, athletic performance. Maybe a financial advisor might be for the client's uh, wealth. But a pastor, you say, man, what should be the primary concern? There's so many things they could be concerned about over the people in life. Paul makes it very plain here that his primary concern in light of everything was their faith. He expressed it over and over again. I don't know if you heard that word mentioned time after time. It's mentioned five times here in this text. He's hoping that they would persevere in their faith. Notice what he says in verse 2. Um, They sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. Uh, Take a look at verse 5. When we could endure it no longer, I I also sent to find out about your faith. He was concerned. How is their faith? He mentions it in verse 6. Also notice verse 7. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you. About what? Their faith. That it was still there. Uh, He mentions it again in verse 10. Verse 8, it doesn't really say uh, the word faith, but he says, we really live. It's like an injection of, of life. If you what? Stand firm in the Lord. Standing firm in their faith in the Lord, not wavering from that. So Paul's primary concern was for the well-being and health of these people's faith. It's a big buzzword around in in places today that our primary concern is for your physical safety and health. You heard that in light of a pandemic? Can I just be forward with you? Our primary concern is for your spiritual health and the status of your faith. Hence, we've taken some of the stands that we've made over the course of time. Not that we could care less about your physical health. We care about that too. Well, let's be real. The most important thing is for our faith. Paul is highly concerned about this, and we might ask, well, Paul, are you being a little overly worried about this? Remember back in chapter 2, Paul compared himself, of all things, to a nursing mother to these people and to a father. You say, Paul, are you just being kind of a little overprotective mom or dad in your relationship with these people? Is this a little overdone? I don't believe it's overdone at all. Paul's concern was legitimate due to several faith-shaking, faith-disturbing conditions surrounding these believers in Thessalonica. He used the term in verse 3, disturbed, could also be translated shaken or wagged, wagged like a dog's tail. There are at least three faith-shaking conditions he reveals that these people were facing. Let's take a look at them. First of all, the abrupt departure of their spiritual leaders. 
not only the abrupt departure, but their continued absence. But chapter 2, verse 17, chapter 2, verse 17, and it's all throughout the book of 1 Thessalonians, and we see it in Acts chapter 17, where the historical account of his time there was given. But they were forced to leave relatively early, and so they were, these people were without Paul, Silas, and Timothy's direct supervision, protection, and care, kind of like that little kitten I saw walking through the grass, and you're like, Where, where's the mob? Anything could come and take this poor little thing out, uh, and, and it happened. Paul felt like this was the situation of these people, kind of these brand new baby Christians, relatively young in the faith, without spiritual leadership. Some of them would have been taking on leadership roles amongst the church family, but as far as Paul, Silas, and Timothy, the guys that were there to show them the way to Jesus and get things going, they were now gone. Another one, secondly, afflictions. Verses 3 and 4, another faith-shaking scenario they were facing were these afflictions of which Paul forewarned them, he said, and of which they saw come real, come true in their lives. They faced it. We learn in many places in Scripture that followers of Jesus Christ will face suffering in this life. When we start to follow Jesus Christ as our Savior, we do not get an exemption from suffering in this life. In fact, what we get is a guarantee of suffering in this life. It says it many times. In fact, Paul tells Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.12, that we will face persecution. We will face suffering. John 16.33, Jesus mentions it. So we don't get an exemption from suffering in this life, but we do get an exemption from any suffering in what life is ahead in eternal life. And so that makes it all worth it. Yes, you sign up for a bit of suffering in this life, but complete exemption from suffering in eternal life to come. But you say, okay, Paul just says afflictions. What are the sources of suffering that these guys faced that you and I face still today? First of all, there was persecution. Again, back in chapter 2, verse 14, we saw that they were being persecuted. But again, a common theme, one of the major things they were facing as a church was the persecution from the unbelievers of Thessalonica. We see, secondly, another source of suffering was spiritual warfare, the battle going on. Chapter 2, verse 18, again, we've already saw that Satan was hindering Paul, Satan's work there, but also we see it in this text when he mentions the tempter in verse 5. But one thing is for certain, Satan hates God. Satan hates what God is doing. Satan hates people. And among people, those that Satan hates the most are those who are following Jesus and trying to do a great work for him. Man, Satan hates you guys the most. (laughs) And so he will fight and battle in every way possible to try to make us useless and ineffective and fruitless for God. And he'll try to make life miserable. So yes, the spiritual battle that is very real, it is a source of suffering. The spiritual uh, satanic and demonic oppression and opposition are all very real. A third source of suffering the tests of our faith for the purpose of refining and strengthening us. At times in our lives, God supplies some pressure. Pressure to our lives that allows the quality of our faith to be tested and allows us the opportunity to strengthen in our faith. And uh, to clarify, it's not that God supplies the test of faith so that He knows the quality of our faith. He, He knows. It's so that you and I, if we are willing to stop and think about how we're responding in the moment, uh, it's for us to have an insight into the quality of our own faith. It's a test for us to see 
our own faith, and it gives us again the opportunity to draw near to God and grow stronger in our faith. And so these types of general tests of faith for their refining and for their strengthening, they were facing it, and of course you and I face it, and we see it detailed in James 1, 2 through 4, among other places in Scripture. Another source of suffering that they face, that we all face, is the discipline of God. Hebrews 12, 5 and following, as a child of God, when we walk in sin, we can expect discipline from our loving Heavenly Father. He does this to reinforce to us that certain behaviors in this life are unacceptable to Him. It's to get us onto the right track. Technically, as a believer, we never experience punishment from God because the punishment was poured out on Christ on the cross. Punishment is motivated by wrath. Uh, the discipline of God is something entirely different. It's motivated out of God's love, and it's the point to train us how we should be living. And so when we begin to veer off the right path, we can expect, and it says in Hebrews 12, 5 and following, He will discipline us. Sometimes God's discipline involves suffering, physical suffering, so as to get our attention. Usually that's not the first thing that He does. His discipline usually begins with something a lot more gentle and a lot more gracious, like He just convicts us through His Word. But when we persist, the discipline levels crank up, and there gets to be a point where he says, I need your attention. And so there's some suffering that he can bring in there to remind us, hey, we're not doing what is pleasing to our Father in heaven, and the things that we're doing are not worth doing. A fifth source of these afflictions that we face in life is the general byproduct of living life within a fallen, sin-corrupted world. <laughs> we live in a world that has been corrupted by sin and all of sin's effects. Illnesses, injuries, all the injustices of life ultimately are just a byproduct of a fallen, sin-corrupted world. And if you live in this world, that's stuff that you face. Well, these believers in Thessalonica were facing suffering and affliction from all of these sources, these different sources, just like we do today. And suffering can make us stronger if we draw near to God in the midst of it. But it can also shake our faith to the point where we walk away where we say, I'm no longer going to follow the Lord. Some might say, hey, if I'm not going to be exempt from suffering because I follow Jesus, why bother? I may as well enjoy the sinful pleasures of the world and suffer rather than deny all of that and still suffer. Well, Paul was concerned that some of these people in the midst of these afflictions were going to be shaken away from the faith. That was part of his pastoral concern from them. For them. Well, there's, so we have the abrupt departure and absence of their spiritual leaders. We have the, these afflictions. Thirdly, a third faith-shaking situation they faced were the temptations from Satan. Paul mentions in verse 5 the tempter. This is a direct reference to Satan and his ministry of tempting the believer into sin. And to uh, clarify here, Satan never makes a person sin. You can't legit say, Satan made me do it. No. It's always your own choice. It's always our own choice. But Satan does know how to make a sinful situation look so appealing and so desiring that oftentimes we willfully walk right into it. These uh, people were facing temptations. Paul was worried that as Satan was tempting them, they would not resist, and that instead they'd fall into sin and ultimately walk away from the Lord. 
How was Satan tempting them? Well, he was tempting them to give up. Just give up. Man, it's too difficult. This life you're living for God, too difficult. Look at all the suffering you're facing. Look at all that you're denying yourself of. It's not worth it. Just give up. You're holding to these truths. Are they really truths? The world says that that's all garbage. The world is screaming against all those things that you're standing up for, things that you say are right and good. Uh, just quit fighting against the world. Just give up. That's what Satan, in part, was tempting him to do. Just give up in standing for the Lord. Also tempting them to give in. Give in to the world's allurements. Give in to your sinful passions that you crave. Living for the world, doing what your own sinful desires want to do is far better than living obediently for God and denying the cravings of your sinful flesh. You know, Satan was tempting these people in this way. We know specifically Satan was tempting these people to be sexually immoral. We know that for a fact. Chapter 4, Paul addresses it deliberately, head on. Uh, they lived in a very immoral society. You say, man, we live in an immoral society, and we do. Sexual temptations all around us every day. These guys were being saved out of a very immoral, idolatrous community. We've talked about it before in our study here, but some of the religions that were going on and the gods and goddesses that they would serve uh, in order to appease that God, they had to be involved sexually with a temple priest uh, prostitute, um, man or woman. And so talk about a hook when they say it's your religious duty to do this. These guys were being tempted to be sexually immoral, to get involved in all the pressures of idolatry and all that was wrapped up in that. A lot of temptation coming their way. So these types of faith-shaking conditions, they faced them, but friends, they still exist around us today. Sometimes, like they, uh, we are experiencing absence from our spiritual leader. You know, uh, we can stay very connected with everybody, but we can't have a spiritual leader walking by your side every second of every day. And so we say, well, I was just this lonely little kitten bouncing around in the grass and a hawk took me out yesterday. Where were you, spiritual leader? Uh, sometimes, you know, we're out on our own. That can be dangerous if we're not careful. And you're thankful that we're not always there hovering like a nursing mom. Oh, there's Pastor Mike. He's still right there hovering over. Oh, there's one of our elders. There's the chairman of the elder board. He's hovering, watching every little last detail of my life. Livy understands when the pastor Mike is always just right there with her. And my kids understand it. Well, there's dad, pastor daddy, he's right there. Well, sometimes we're away from our spiritual leadership. Sometimes we are facing affliction as it manifests in any of its different forms. Sometimes we're tempted by Satan and his alluring worldly system to do what our sinful desires crave. The question is not, are we facing these things? Because we are all facing these faith-shaking conditions day in and day out. It's a constant in our life. The question is, are they successfully shaking your faith? You're facing them. But are those things shaking you, disturbing your faith? Are you beginning to wander from your faith and your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you standing strong? Because of this great and legitimate concern for their faith, it led Paul to take some decisive action, action that would cost him greatly on a personal level. Perhaps sometimes people get, wor people get worried about other people's faith, but they don't do anything about it. They just sit there and worry. I'm worried about them. Um, Paul didn't just sit there and worry, he, he actually made some big decisions that actually cost him personally. What did he do? 
he sent Timothy to them. He sent Timothy to go and get a report. But also, he says there in verse 2, to strengthen and encourage their faith. This decision would cost Paul personally. Notice four ways sending Timothy would cost Paul personally. First, he would be left in Athens alone. Talk about a pagan city, the city of Athens. It's not one that you would want to take on the task of evangelizing alone. You're supposed to go in and do some ministry there. It's not one that you'd say, I personally am going all by myself. You say, well, where was Luke? Wasn't Luke part of the team? If you're reading through the book of Acts, we stop seeing Luke say we as they depart from Philippi. It's possible that Luke was hanging out there ministering to the church uh, of the Philippians. What about Silas? Silas was always following right there. Well, we know that they were driven out of Thessalonica and they went to Berea. Possible that even though the angry mob left Thessalonica and came over to Berea and drove Paul out, that Silas maybe was able to hang out there and continue to minister among them. But now, Paul says that they had a discussion, you know, we're leaving Macedonia, the region of Macedonia, we're heading south into the region of Achaia, Athens is our next target, it really would be good to have the team, but I think the believers in Thessalonica need help even more. So they made the decision. It's going to be best, actually, Timothy, for you to go back to Thessalonica. And I'll just head to Athens alone. And so, Paul was willing to make that sacrifice. Timothy left to go get this report and strengthen and encourage their hearts, and Paul enters into Athens alone. Timothy being absent also means that Paul would lack a source of Christian fellowship in a godless city. Paul calls Timothy, my brother. Timothy was often referred to as Paul's son in the faith because Paul led him to the Lord, but here Paul is looking at Timothy as his brother, his companion in this. Going into a godless city of Athens, I mean, as far as the one true God, they had multiple false gods, many countless false gods. But Paul was going to be there without any Christian fellowship he would be without a teammate in a spiritually dark area. Paul calls him God's fellow worker in the gospel in this text. God was using Timothy for the work of the gospel, just as God was using Paul for the work of the gospel. And they were going to Athens for the work of the gospel, but Paul was not going to have this great teammate in Timothy, for Timothy was going to go. It cost Paul greatly. Also, it was going to cost Paul a strengthening and encouraging companion. If Timothy was sent to strengthen and encourage the Thessalonian believers' faith, if Timothy was good at doing that and that was the best option, well, then who was going to be there, humanly speaking, to strengthen and encourage Paul? Well, he was going to be alone. Paul's pastoral heart is seen here in his willingness to sacrifice something so dear to him to sacrifice his own needs to take care of the needs of, of other people's faith. From this example, you and I need to learn that we need to be willing to help other people when they are facing the pressures of these types of faith-shaking conditions in life. You and I need to be willing to step up and help, even if it costs us something like our time, or our money, or our energy. It might be inconvenient. So I want to just more pointedly ask you, is there someone in your life right now that's having their faith shaken? And it's working. It's shaking them. You might need to step up. Like it may need to be you. You may need to step up and it may cost you something. It may cost you a little bit of your time. You may have to go over to talk to them. You may have to invite them to lunch, and you might have to pay. 
You might have to invite them for coffee. It may cost you a little bit. We say that's insignificant in light of the big picture, and it's true. You may need to write them an encouraging note. You might say legitimately, I am not the one. It's not just because I'm scared or I, I don't know what to say, but I'm legitimately not able to help this person in their specific need, but I do know someone who can. It may cost you trying to make that connection, you taking the time and energy and effort to get them connected with someone that can help them. Paul was so concerned for these people's faith, and rightly so, and rather than sit by and do nothing about it but worry, he made the decision to help, even if it cost him. So he sent Timothy, and Timothy's ministry was a successful one. It was a successful mission. He went to Thessalonica to see how things were going. He strengthened and encouraged their faith, and then he was able to return back to Paul. So let's, we, we figure that they... They were in a hurry to leave Berea because of the people from Thessalonica driving them out. And so Paul's heading down to Athens, and Timothy probably, because it's shorter, he probably just went straight over to Thessalonica, back one city, rather than going to Athens and then going back up and around. So he goes back. At that meantime, Paul spends just a short amount of time in Athens and then heads further south to Corinth. You know, are you familiar with the the Corinthian letters, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Paul spent an extended amount of time in Corinth, and that's where Timothy met Paul. After the ministry in Thessalonica, he finds Paul in Corinth and gives this report. And what a great report this was. Uh, just so you know, as we're entering into this second point, verses 6 through 8, Paul's relief these next two points, you can experience relief, are shorter than the first point, so don't worry. Paul experienced such relief from this, this report. They were comforted by this good news of their condition. What was their condition? He outlines it here. In the beginning of verse 6, they were maintaining faith and love. Paul was primarily concerned with what? Their faith. He was very concerned but in, apparently, Timothy was also very impressed with another virtue they were expressing, their love. Because Paul, in this, this uh, verse 6, he mentions also their faith and love. That wasn't his initial concern. That was like a secondary thing. But apparently, they were heavily involved in a proper love of one another. And so he's writing back that this faith and this bonus virtue, that they are also maintaining love, he says that's good news. Interesting that he used that term translated good news because that's also the word that's often translated in Scripture, the gospel. <laughs> so to Paul at this moment, the excitement of their sustaining and surviving faith was at this moment about as exciting as the gospel saving faith this was good news notice also in verse 6 the report was that they kind they think kindly of us and they long to see us it is so nice to be loved and appreciated Paul gave so much of himself for these people. He loved them. He desired to see them. At times he wondered, do they feel the same way? Uh, are these feelings mutual? Or are these people just out doing their own thing and I never cross their minds? Uh, is it possible that they're beginning to believe the lies of the angry unbelievers in Thessalonica that are trying to tarnish our ministry by telling those lies that, oh yeah, those leaders, they just abandoned you. They couldn't take the pressure. They ran away. Or they were in it for the money and they didn't see you guys were giving them anything and so they left. All those lies, Paul's thinking, are they believing those lies or are they just not even thinking of us at all? Well, to Paul's joy, Timothy said, 
Paul, they have the nicest things to think about you and say about you. Man, they long to see you just as you long to see them. The feelings are mutual. They can't wait for you to come back. How nice it is for a spiritual leader to know that the love, the kind thoughts, the desire to spend time together is not one-sided. And so in this case, Paul's actually expressing one of those intimate details of a pastor's heart as he can't help but contain this aspect of the report. Man, you guys love to see us. You're thinking kindly of us. Man, does that warm our hearts. I thought maybe it was all one-sided. In verse 7, Paul mentions their faith a second time in that they were standing firm in their faith in the Lord. In all the distresses and afflictions that Paul and his team were personally facing, he says that news of their faith was a comfort. And not only was it a comfort, it was like an infusion of life to him. Notice what he says there in verse 8. Now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. They're standing firm in their faith in the Lord despite all that the devil was throwing at them, all that the world was throwing at them. It was, it was like a shot of life into Paul and his team. It was so encouraging. And I'll tell you, it is powerfully encouraging to spiritual leaders when they see the people And it's painful to see them have to endure the afflictions and the trials and the temptations and all the sufferings. It's painful to see the people go through that. But there is something so encouraging when, as the dust settles, they're still standing firm in their faith in the Lord. Talk about an infusion of life. I'll tell you, not only does it bring encouragement, it brings an inspiration to your spiritual leaders. Because the spiritual leaders do what? They teach you about walking in joy and steadfastly through the trials, you know, resist temptation. But your spiritual leaders are just people as well, and they face the same distresses. Paul says, in our distresses and in, in our afflictions, Paul's facing the same thing. You think he was never tempted to give up or walk away? He was. But he says, man, when you guys come through, oh man, it's like extra encouragement for us to keep pressing on and staying the course. It's inspirational. You need to know that. When you keep pressing on and standing firm in the faith, despite all that that's going on out there, it inspires not only your peers, but your spiritual leaders. So the faith-shaking afflictions and temptations were not being successful in knocking these people down. They weren't giving up. They weren't giving in. They weren't believing the world's lies. They weren't throwing away their faith, their trust in God and in His Word. They continued to press on in the faith and in love and in their support of Paul and the team. And as we can expect, Paul was so full of gratitude. So thankful. In verses 9 and 10, we see Paul's gratitude to God. He mentions yet again, we've seen him say it several other times in the letter already, that he was praying for them. And he and his team, as they prayed, they were first overflowing with thanksgiving and joy. He says, what thanks can we render to God for you? Paul, it's like he's unable to come up with the words to express the great intensity of the gratitude and joy he felt because of this report he heard of how they keep they they were keeping the faith and pressing on i mean this news made paul's day but in addition to praying in in gratitude paul was also presenting a request he says that they were also asking that god would allow them to return to continue the work of, on their faith. To Paul, a pastor's work was never done. Because nobody, no one of us in this life will ever arrive. There never become a point in time where 
any of us in this life have grown up enough into our faith that there is no longer any room for growth or maturity. There's always going to be room to grow and mature. And so Paul prayed earnestly that God would allow him to return and continue the ministry among those believers. And that though their faith was not being shaken, which was a good thing, he didn't see them as being, okay, hands off on you then. No, he said, Lord, help me to go back and be able to help them grow and mature even more. So Paul really does open up his heart here, but he's been opening up his heart since chapter 1, verse 2, after his introductory statement. He just begins to open up his heart. But we see some unique attributes here. Yes, chapter 1, he's very thankful for these many qualities and activities of this church. In chapter 2, yes, these are some great aspects of his ministry that made it so successful, and he was pouring out his heart in rejoicing and all of that. But in chapter 3, realizing that their abrupt departure left these believers in a very dangerous situation that could lead to their, their faith being shaken apart, he was so concerned. He wanted to see them maintain faith and stand firm in the Lord. So concerned was Paul that he made a decision to sacrifice his own needs for the care of others. And as he received the report back for how well they were doing and how appreciative they were for Paul and all the work that he had given toward them, he could barely describe with words the thanksgiving and joy he felt. And then rather than saying, okay, Evidently, you're good to go on your own. If you survive that, you'll survive anything. Paul said, nope, I'm hoping to come back and continue to continue to help, to continue to help you grow in your faith. Again, by title, not all of us here are pastors, but as brothers and sisters in Christ, we ought to have a love and care for one another that desires to see that steadfastness and health of people's faith, of each other's faith. We face the same afflictions and temptations as they did. You and I are not immune from having our faith shaken. By way of application, as we close here, there may be some of us here who are having our faith effectively, greatly shaken by the things of this world. And if that's you and you say, man, you're talking about this stuff and my faith is being shaken down. I am disturbed. My faith is very weak. I feel like I'm walking away and I'm about done. I would encourage you to find some help. <laughs> that you find someone and that you be open and honest with them and receive some encouragement and help from them. But secondly, Speaking to those of us who are standing firm in the faith, we need to be keeping a loving eye out on our brothers and sisters in Christ with a shepherd's compassion for them, a desire to protect them, a desire to feed them and nurture them along as they seek to grow up in the Lord. Along with that, we need to be praying that God would instill within us that type of heart and the eyes to be able to see what we need to see in our brothers and sisters in Christ so as to help them. And to pray that God give us the wisdom to effectively help. Even if it costs us something, like our time, our resources, our energy. We've got to be willing to do what it takes to help them or to connect them with someone who can. Well, let's pray and then we'll move forward into our communion ceremony here. Let's pray. Lord, we, in light of this text, we want to thank you for spiritual leaders that we've all had in life, mentors, spiritual leaders, pastors, elders. Thank you for them. Lord, we want to pray that you would help us all to have this kind of shepherd's compassion for the people around us. For those who are having their faith shaken, Lord, help them to find strength in you Help others to surround them and to encourage them. And Lord, for the rest of us, help us to stand firm. 
Help us to have wisdom as to how to help. Give us the resources on how to do so, Lord. In some cases, the boldness and bravery to even go and talk to someone that we see is struggling and maybe they don't even know or care they're struggling. But give us the boldness to go help. But thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to spend some time in your word. And as we turn our attention to the communion service, we rejoice in Christ's sacrifice for our sins, for his body being broken, uh, receiving the punishment that was meant for us, his blood being shed for the forgiveness of our sins. We're so thankful, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll ask the... uh, servers to uh, get the elements ready. It looks like the elements are ready, but today is Communion Sunday, and uh, as we participate in communion, we are remembering the Lord Jesus' death. Uh, We're told to do this as a church by Jesus so that we never forget the sacrifice that He made and what our sin cost Him. We've all sinned. We We all stand guilty before a holy and just God. And because of our sin, someone's going to have to pay the price. That's just the bottom line. Uh, Naturally speaking, um, the guilty one should pay the price. And every guilty one will pay the price unless they receive the substitute that God offered. God is just, yes. He is full of wrath over sin, yes. But He is also loving and merciful, and He would rather forgive you and me. He would rather give us mercy. And so he sent Jesus to be our substitute, to take the punishment of the sins that we've committed and to pay the price that needs to be paid because of our sin. And so Jesus died on a cross. It was there that he paid our debt, that he took our punishment. On the third day, of course, he rose again, proving that it was accepted, proving that God... Uh, accepted that substitutionary sacrifice. And Jesus offers eternal life and forgiveness of sins to anyone and everyone who, in understanding they need a Savior, calls out to Jesus and says, I believe you did that for me. I accept what you've done for me. I believe you died for my sins and rose again. And so in communion, when we take the bread... We remember that Jesus' body received the punishment. It was beaten with the punishment that was meant for you and me, the guilty one. So we remember that as we take the bread. And when we take the cup, we remember Jesus' blood that was shed to provide us cleansing from anything and everything that we do. So uh, just as far as practically speaking, how we're going to do this, we're going to sing um, and uh, To get the elements, you're going to exit row by row out the side aisle. You're going to come back in through the center aisle, and right outside these two doors are the element trays, and you're going to find a stack of two cups. One has the bread, and one has the juice. Take a stack of both cups, and then come back to your seat. And uh, in the meantime, we want to ask you, based upon Scripture in 1 Corinthians 11, to examine your heart before taking communion. If there's some unconfessed sin going on, confess it to the Lord between you and Him. And uh, we want to invite anybody who is part of the, the body of Christ to take communion with us. And if you say, I haven't asked Jesus to be my Savior yet, well, we would ask you to do so just to begin to believe that he died on the cross for you and rose again, and then you're welcome to take communion with us. Um, So you may sing along with us, of course. Perhaps you would rather uh, spend some time in silent prayer, evaluating your heart and confessing it to the Lord. But uh, let's pray, and then we will sing and we'll dismiss row by row. Lord, we want to thank you for... Pray that you would uh, uh, just touch our hearts with this great sacrifice that was made. Lord, it cost you, Father, it cost you your son, the Lord Jesus. Jesus, it cost you your life. Thank you for doing that for us. We want to praise your name in Jesus' name. Dismiss the front rows.
cast my mind to Calvary when Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body Drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. First, we have the bread, which represents Jesus' body. It says, The Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take together. Presenting Jesus' innocent blood that was shed. It says, In the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take together. It goes on to say that as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Yes, he died. He did not stay dead. He rose again on the third day. Let's stand, continue this song, and sing about that truth. Then on the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again, O oh, trampled dead, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Oh, pray. 
Thanks for being with us here today. May God bless you all. We are dismissed.